The mayor and first lady announced J. Philip Thompson as the city's new deputy mayor for strategic policy initiatives. Thompson will oversee many of the city's signature initiatives, including affordable housing, sustainability, education, and health care access. Talk a bit about why you chose to do this job. You, you touched on it in your last appearance, but you were pretty happily ensconced doing thought leadership and practice in different places, start doing field <laughs> research, and yet you listened, you, you succumbed to uh, Bill de Blasio's appeals and came back to New York City. Why? I've known the mayor for a long time. Um, we've talked about issues for a long time. Um, he said, why don't you come to New York and make it a laboratory? Let's take some of these ideas and put them into practice and create models and kind of like spread the gospel. Um, and I want that to happen in New York. So that's hard to turn down. What are you most proud of having done so far? Um, actually getting staff in City Hall and in the agencies to understand uh, what's lacking in our democracy. Uh, and understand why it's lacking and why economic democracy is actually a pathway, not only for improving our economy, but also improving and restoring our democracy. Um, I think we're making progress on that. And I think that uh, economic democracy was actually the original American dream, and the slave owners overturned it. Economic democracy was part of the Civil War and part of Reconstruction after the Civil War, and the restoration of the Confederacy overturned it. So to elaborate on that a little bit. The 13th Amendment, which says, uh, was ended chattel slavery in 1863, also said no more involuntary servitude. Involuntary servitude in 1853 was also called wage slavery at that time. And the idea that a person should work for another person because they have no other means of survival that was considered in 1863 involuntary servitude. And the belief was every worker ought to have 40 acres in rural area, 40 acres and a mule was a popular slogan at the time. That people thought they was part of the 13th Amendment. It just wasn't just about ending chattel slavery for black folks. It was actually uplifting all workers. That was the goal. All of those meanings of the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and so forth were overturned by a conservative Supreme Court and conservative government after the violent suppression of black folks who couldn't vote for 100 years after the Civil War, of progressive whites who were imprisoned um, and also repressed after the Civil War. And then there was a movement called the Populist Movement, right on the heels of this, when poor white farmers, poor black farmers, again said, no, we want to fight for economic democracy, for equity, for freedom, for a chance, for ownership in this economy and all that. That is what led to racial segregation. When they ran a candidate for president in 1896 on a progressive party platform, populist party platform, the Supreme Court did Plessy versus Ferguson that literally used federal government to physically separate poor blacks, poor whites, and that is what created mm. a national system of racial segregation. So this has been a fight over and over again, something the civil rights movement is, was fully aware of. The 1954 Brown versus Board of Education lawsuit, which brought about racial integration of schools. If you go back and read the NAACP's amicus brief, they said the reason we have racial segregation is to divide workers, poor white workers from black workers. That's why it exists in the first place. That's why we have to end it in schools. Um, so this has been a long fight in America. If you were to paint in broad strokes your initiatives today, what would you call them? How are they different from what we've seen before? And is it just a tweaking of the system that you're talking about or a whole new system? Well, I think what happened uh, with the New Deal, which was created actually uh, in opposition, as you said, to this notion of laissez-faire capitalism or business can solve all problems, free enterprise will solve all problems, utter failure. Um, the New Deal, though, made major compromises that actually I think we're grappling with to this day. Mostly around race and class and gender. Yeah, and particularly race. Um, uh, black and Latino workers, agricultural workers, domestic workers were excluded from labor protections. Unionism, when it was built in this country, was done on a segregated basis in the main. So worker solidarity, 
never really emerged. Uh, Martin Luther King in 1961 went to the AFL-CIO National Convention and said, I will end the civil rights movement. We don't need two movements of poor people fighting for the same thing. I'll bring 40 million black people into the labor movement. Then we can have our social democracy. Only four of 72 unions supported King in that. And we saw the labor movement decline steadily after that when Nixon and Reagan continued to use race to divide folks. And what is Trump doing now? Exactly that. Yeah. And so I think the problems that, uh, that more public engagement, more public ownership, economic democracy have faced in this country from the beginning have had to, centrally had to do with race. And now gender to me is a good thing. Women are beginning to say, hey, we want our rights in the economy as well as everywhere else. And so I think there's more opportunity now than ever before to maybe win on these issues. But we see Trump using the border crisis, immigration, everything in his power to try and resurrect and revive that traditional, narrow, racist, um, individualistic kind of approach to the economy. And restore, he's a billionaire. Billionaires are gonna be the saviors of poor white folks. Um, even though there's no basis in fact or reality about that, he appeals to people's emotions and that legacy of racism. Yeah. To say someone else is out to get something away from you, you're a hardworking, decent person, these other people are no good. How, with this huge expanse of both knowledge and perspective, do you seek to affect a city? Mm -hmm. And why do you think a city is a place of the kind of macro change that you're, I think, talking about? Well, let me say first of all that um, I think cities are great learning laboratories. And almost the New Deal, before it became national policy, was local policy. It was Mayor LaGuardia. It was many other cities who had experimented with different ways to improve the economy, different ways to improve housing conditions different ways to improve health conditions. So I think cities are that. Cities are where universities tend to be, where knowledge tends to be cultivated, developed. And so these experiments are scrutinized and evaluated, and then out of that come programs. So I think cities are great for that. The other thing I think is that thinking of the economy as somehow um, a system that has an internal logic that operates all by itself, separate from society and politics, is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And I think we've had enough experience around the world with various forms of socialism, various forms of capitalism, to actually say, for this kind of market or sector of the economy, say healthcare, this approach doesn't work well, this other approach does. In housing, it's structured differently, this kind of approach works well, we've seen this other approach doesn't. I think modern economies have to be approached that way. And what's most important is that the population is involved in setting goals. What do we want to come out of our economic policies, out of our government policies? And cities are the best place for local citizens to really engage in what it means to run and determine your own economic future, which is tied to your educational system, it's tied to your social welfare system, it's tied to everything else.